we've talked about a number of key uh, things this morning with respect to uh, how we can work together more effectively. When we look at calls for proposals, one of the most important things for partners is to look very closely at what it is that the department is asking for. The relevance of what's being proposed is a key uh, element with respect to how we work together and how we ensure that we get the best proposals for the work that we're planning to do overseas. Results-based management is incredibly important with respect to the work that we're planning to do. So having a clear outline of the results to be achieved and how we're going to ensure that those results are sustainable for the benefit of, uh, of the people we're working with. And then finally, recognizing that we are in an incredibly risky environment in many contexts. So having a clear idea of what the risks are and what the strategies are going to be for addressing those risks will be important for us to see in any proposal that we're working with. Uh, we had a really good call, uh, dialogue this morning with respect to uh, members uh, and, and how we can work together more effectively. So for information with respect to that, you can click on the website and see that information. For information with respect to the types of uh, guidance on results-based management, risk management, and how to apply for uh, funding from Global Affairs Canada, you can see our website and some of the links with respect to uh, that guidance. From, from Global Affairs Canada's perspective, this is part of a continuing dialogue with respect to how we can improve the effectiveness of what we do uh, in terms of the programming that is designed to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. This is incredibly important. Um, we're going to be talking about process during this panel, and some people might say, well, where, where's the fun in that? Uh, process, you know, is one thing, but shouldn't we be talking about those incredibly important goals that we have set in the Sustainable Development Goals with respect to climate change, with respect to gender equality, with respect to poverty reduction? And the answer is, if we don't get the process right, we don't stand a chance of achieving those goals. We have to make sure that we've got effective programming with respect to results-based management, with respect to risk management, with respect to financial management. These are the building blocks that will get us there with respect to the achievement of the, um, of the Sustainable Development Goals. So we're going to lead uh, through a presentation uh, which is going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the context for this. We're going to talk about the, um, the policy context some of the funding mechanisms that, uh, that we use at uh, Global Affairs Canada. I'm going to do a deep dive on one of the recent calls for proposals as well uh, with respect to small and medium-sized organizations. This was a big uh, call. It was an important call coming out of the International Assistance Review and the new policy, the Feminist International Assistance Policy. And so I want to talk a little bit about how that's gone, where we're at in that process, and some considerations for those that may have applied in that or maybe considering applying for, uh, for future uh, calls under that initiative. Then we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about next steps. So the Feminist International Assistance Policy. It's been a year and a half since we launched this. Um, the policy, from my perspective, stands out in several key ways. Uh, first, it arose from the International Assistance Review, which involved extensive consultations here in Canada as well as abroad. With, uh, with stakeholders, with beneficiaries, with organizations that, uh, that are involved in the implementation of programming. It was also the first policy review which took place in Global Affairs Canada in an integrated context. And one of the things you'll see when we talk about international assistance, it's different than international development but it, because it includes international security which is a key uh, programming mechanism which was previously in Foreign Affairs Canada, which is now part of the, the broader mix of, um, of mechanisms that we have in Global Affairs Canada, and it's absolutely crucial to achieving the sorts of development objectives that we've got outlined in the, uh, in the Sustainable Development Goals. We need a secure context in order for development to be effective, and uh, international security programming plays a key part in that. So it's that more integrated approach that we're starting to see, which is one of the benefits of the, of the amalgamation. I think the third and, and one of the most important things and one of the key features of the Feminist International Assistance Policy is its focus on gender equality as one of the key means of achieving the uh, Sustainable Development Goals and achieving poverty reduction. That is a feature which is there as a, as a standout um, action area, but it also uh, is encapsulated in all of the action areas under the policy. So this is one of the things which is vitally important uh, as we look at proposals, uh, either unsolicited or in calls, 
is that gender equality, how the proposal is going to help women and girls, is a centerpiece of, uh, of what we're looking at. So uh, I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. One of the other things that was really important with respect to the uh, Feminist International Assistance Policy and the, and the International Assistance Review was the fact that we focused on how. I've been part of many international aid reviews in the past, and I can tell you that this is the first time that we looked at the question of how. How will we deliver? What sort of changes do we need to make to our mechanisms in order to be more effective? Um, this has never been uh, a feature of previous uh, reviews. Um, I was actually privileged to co-chair a, a task force with respect to this on uh, delivery partnerships and, and innovation during the International Assistance Review. And we looked at a number of key factors here and we heard from partners with respect to this. The key thing that we heard was make global affairs easier to work with, please. Um, and that was something that we heard loud and clear and it's influencing how we've moved forward since then. Uh, we also heard about the importance of diversifying the partners that we work with, and we heard about the importance of exploring new and innovative ways in a context in which um, many of the traditional mechanisms that we've used uh, are, have been bypassed by other mechanisms out there, in, including uh, private sector engagement. So we need to make sure that we up our game in terms of the types of tools that we use. It doesn't mean that the old tools are not relevant, but it does mean that we need to enhance the number of tools and the, uh, and the types of tools we've got in our toolbox. Um, I work in a, in a branch of Global Affairs kind of called the uh, Partnership for Development Innovation branch. And we look at all of these issues from the perspective of the work that we do with Canadian partners. Uh, our focus is on working with and supporting Canadian uh, civil society organizations to work with overseas partners to achieve the, uh, the priorities outlined in the Feminist International Assistance Policy and in the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, this is different from other partners or other mechanisms within the department. We've got geographic programming that, uh, that works primarily with country partners. Uh, we'll work with Canadian uh, civil society organizations, but the primary focus is that engagement with country partners. Um, as well, we have a multilateral branch, which is looking more at international financial institutions, UN institutions, etc. Our focus is, first and foremost, working with Canadian partners and facilitating that work in terms of uh, the work overseas. There are two principal mechanisms that we use to engage Canadian partners. One is calls for proposal. Uh, the other is unsolicited proposals. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between the two of those. Calls for proposal, ha or call for proposals, have a set budget already allocated. And before we let a call out, we already have a, a pool of money available, and a sense of what we want to achieve with that uh, pool of money. And so this is really important because in seeking that approval, we have outlined for the minister what we're seeking to achieve, um, and we have outlined some cri criteria with respect to that. Those criteria uh, are clearly outlined on the, on the launch page, and it's a competitive process. So anyone seeking to, uh, to get to some of the money uh, that has been approved under the call, you're competing against a large number of other organizations. And I'll talk a little bit about that in, uh, in a moment. Unsolicited proposals are very different. This is an idea that you have formed. Um, you have set the criteria yourself with respect to what's the thematic area you're focused on, what's the geographic area you're focused on, what sort of um, results are you trying to achieve? So it's very much your idea. You're seeking a home for that idea by either coming to uh, Partnerships for Development Innovation Branch or a geographic program or some other part of the department that uh, you're hoping may have some money available for that unsolicited proposal. It's not a competitive process. It's very much a question of you finding a home for that proposal where there's a fit in terms of the mandate and the scope of the proposal that, uh, that you have in mind. So two very, very different contexts in terms of uh, what, you're, uh, what you're up against. One in which you're trying to find a home, the other, there's a clear home, but you're up against a whole bunch of other organizations in terms of, uh, in terms of a competitive process. 
in order to try and make all of this easier, one of the things that we've been working on in the last year is something we call the Task Force for Improving Effectiveness. And uh, in the last year, I've been privileged to chair that, uh, working with a number of members from uh, civil society organizations on the steering committee, including, including the Alberta Council. And Heather's been a, uh, a member of the steering committee, and we've had a fantastic collaboration in terms of, uh, in terms of that task force. Uh, that task force works with what we call solution teams. We identify issues. And we say, okay, here's some problems. Now let's put together a team of Global Affairs Canada employees and civil society partners, and let's, uh, let's work this, the problem and come up with some solutions. Um, one of the areas that uh, we've uh, focused on in terms of a solution team is calls for proposals. So um, how can we make the calls for proposals system or mechanism more efficient, more effective in terms of, uh, in terms of getting us good proposals and good projects at the end of the day? Uh, more than 50 recommendations have come out of that process in the last year, and we've already implemented a large number of those. So this is, from, from my perspective, been an incredibly um, uh, fruitful uh, dialogue that we've had, and we've already had, I think, some, some really good process changes that we've, uh, we've seen. Uh, if we look at the recommendations that came out on uh, calls for proposals, uh, things such as give us more lead time. Um, if you want us to have a good proposal, we as partners need to have sufficient lead time to talk to overseas partners and to uh, put pen to paper and make sure that that actually is something that we can give you. Um, so in order to make that real, uh, we've committed to giving you uh, advance notice of eight weeks. We're going to give you lead time. We've got something coming up. Here it is. Be ready because we're going to be launching this uh, within the next two months. Um, and then an additional six weeks to actually put pen to paper and make sure that uh, you've had sufficient time to actually give that proposal um, a really good airing in terms of reflecting the types of ideas that you've got in response. Um, the other thing that we've uh, put in place is a calendar of calls uh, so that you've got, a, again, a, an over-the-horizon sense of what's coming up and an ability to prioritize. Um, if you know that there's a pro uh, call for proposal coming out on one topic, but a few weeks later, there'll be another one, and actually you're more interested in that second one, that's then where you're probably going to put your effort rather than uh, putting on something that uh, may not be as good a fit for you. Um, need process clarity and transparency was another key ask from partners. And uh, one of the things we've done there, Denise talked about this in terms of the importance of questions and answers. Uh, we publish those on the web. Uh, if you ask us a question during a call for proposal process, I can guarantee you it will be on the web for everyone to see, because we want to make sure that the answer to that is not available only to you, but it's available to everyone. Keeping in mind this is a competitive process. Um, we're also going to give you an indication of which questions and answers on that list are new and which ones are old. If you were into that last week, you don't need to reread what you just read before. You want to reread, or you want to read what's new. What's new, what's exciting, what is it that I haven't heard before? And so we're giving you a sense of that as well. Um, one thing you've also told us very clearly is, don't make us work over the Christmas holidays, please. Don't set the deadline during the Christmas holidays or in the week after. Uh, we've heard you on that. Uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, again, minimum six to eight weeks to actually write it. And if we're going to set a deadline, it won't be January 5th, January 6th. It's going to be at least another week after that so that you can enjoy a little bit of turkey with friends and family and, uh, and not be worrying about that. There have been a lot of calls for proposals that have taken place in 2018. Um, a lot of opportunities then for funding. Um, I'm going to speak to a couple of those that uh, are particularly important that, uh, that our branch is responsible for. One is the small and medium-sized organizations um, call. And uh, Denise was, uh, you know, was saying, no, no, it's a higher number. It is indeed a high number in terms of the number of applications, 196. Uh, and I have it on good authority from Heather and others that uh, in the next call under small and medium-sized organizations, we may be looking at even more. So highly, highly competitive environment. Um, what I can tell you is that um, that was more than 10 times in terms of the actual ask for funding than we had allocated under that first call. Um, so don't be surprised if, uh, if about 90% of the organizations that applied in that first round uh, were not successful. Uh, that is, in fact, the reality. So it is highly, highly competitive, and we're expecting it to stay that way. That's fantastic in some ways, in that it gives us a great uh, pool of, of applications uh, for proposals that, uh, that uh, we can choose from. But the, the downside is that there are a lot of organizations, ultimately, that will not be successful. 
Um, we saw the same thing in the Her Voice, Her Choice call for proposals with respect to uh, sexual and reproductive health rights. Again, um, large number of proposals asking for a large amount of money and about 10 times what we had actually allocated. So um, just keep that in mind. Uh, we certainly encourage you to apply, but keep the, re the expectations realistic, noting that you're in a highly competitive process. Um, just to deep dive a little bit more on the, um, uh, on the uh, small and medium-sized organizations call, um, the objective there was very much to diversify the types of partners we work with, uh, was to target types of organizations rather than looking at a specific uh, SDG or, or action area or geographic region. So in some ways this gave you, gave you a huge amount of flexibility in terms of the type of proposal to present to us. But Keep in mind there was a very specific type of organization we were looking for. It was an organization that was much smaller than some of the traditional partners we've been working with. And, um, and we were hoping for organizations that were uh, fairly new in the, uh, in the space. We got a lot of, op uh, of um, proposals from new organizations and, uh, and several of those uh, will uh, ultimately be successful. But uh, this is a new space and we recognize that for, uh, for many organizations this was their first time in actually applying to Global Affairs Canada through this type of mechanism. Uh, there will be a, uh, another call under the small and medium sized organizations uh, window uh, early in 2019. So if you were not successful in the first round, do keep that in mind. There will be another round and there will be in fact a further one after that. So uh, it wasn't a uh, one and done, it was very much uh, a continuing process and this is part of that predictability that we're trying to, uh, to give to you. So what's the, uh, the, the system look like? What's the, what's the interior of this, as Denise was saying? So this is where it maybe gets a little bit interesting in terms of the internal mechanism. Um, how do we actually assess your proposal? First and foremost, eligibility criteria. This is absolutely essential. Um, because what we're going to do is we're going to list on the, on the call page when we launch criteria such as the size of the project, the duration of the project that we're looking for, is there a, ge a geographic or thematic focus involved in it, uh, are we looking for cost share, if so, how much, what type of organization are we looking for. So these are just examples. Um, every call differs. So look really closely at those eligibility criteria because they will never be the same. Uh, each call will have something different. And that's really, really important for you because if you get any of those wrong, uh, we will screen you out. Uh, we have to apply those criteria equally. We can't make exceptions because if we're doing that, then uh, we're not being fair and transparent. So it's really, really important that you pay close attention to that. Those criteria are absolutely essential to, uh, to being screened in and for us to actually get into the meat of uh, what you've given us in terms of the proposal. So look very, very carefully at that. Um, merit assessment, that's where we actually look at the proposal and say, okay, what have we got here? Is this something that we think could potentially be a good project? Um, so it's the content of your proposal. Uh, we're going to be assessing um, a number of items there. Uh, I've, I've listed them on the slide. Alors, uh, il y a vraiment uh, beaucoup de, de critères, beaucoup de, de contenu qu'on qu cherche dans une proposition. Um, we really are looking for a proposal that's going to make a good project. And I'm going to come back in, in a moment in terms of where we saw a lot of strengths in what we were receiving, where we saw some weaknesses parce qu'il y avait euh, vraiment des, des points forts et euh, des points euh, faibles. Uh, best fit, it's quite likely, and it has been the case recently, that some of the proposals that uh, make it through the merit assessment, um, that uh, they will still not be funded. And the reason for that is we may very well have simply too many good proposals. And in that context, we're going to look at best fit, which is, what are the strongest proposals that most closely align with the criteria that we've outlined and, and what we're trying to do? So uh, if we look at some of the more uh, recent calls, that was very much the case. We did get to a best fit assessment where we were simply saying, okay, of these X number of proposals, what are the best of the best that we're going to proceed with? Um, and although there are others that pass merit, we simply don't have enough funds to fund them all. Again, supply and demand. And in these proposals, uh, both the um, Her Voice, Her Choice and the SMO, uh, the demand far exceeded the supply that we had allocated. Lessons on eligibility. Um, 
Important to know about 30% of applicants were screened out at this stage because they did not meet all of the eligibility criteria. And that's, that's a real shame because that means that we did not go on to read the proposal. So absolutely essential that you pay close attention to what we put on the eligibility criteria uh, because that is, uh, that means either you're, you're in uh, in terms of the, us looking at the proposal or you're not. Um, some key areas there to look at. Um, if you're trying to demonstrate experience in a sector, really make sure it speaks strongly to the experience you've got. We can't make assumptions. We may have even worked with you in the past. We know you've got that experience, but if it's not demonstrated in the, in the proposal, we can't give you the benefit of the doubt because we can't do that for organizations that we don't know. We can't do it for organizations that we know. So it's really important that you demonstrate that experience strongly. And there were certainly cases where, uh, for example, uh, projects on uh, water, uh, sanitation and hygiene, um, that the experience simply wasn't fully demonstrated, even though we have a general awareness that, that that organization probably does have that experience. We couldn't make that assumption based on what we were seeing on paper. Financial statements. If we ask you for financial statements, make sure you give them to us. Uh, if you don't, uh, that's a problem. Um, if we ask for cost share and you don't indicate what that is, that's a problem. Um, the duration. If we're asking for a five-year project, don't give us a six-year project. Um, if it's a minimum of two years, don't give us one year. It's got to be the right duration. We're looking for a certain time frame. We've got a certain amount of mon money available over a certain duration, and the, and the funds need to uh, be allocated to projects that meet that. Uh, and the, the status uh, of the organization. In this case, um, for example, with the small and medium-sized organizations, we had certain criteria with respect to the size of the organization. Um, if your organization did not meet those criteria, it was, it was screened out. So again, be clear on that in terms of um, what we're looking for and in terms of the, the type of organization. Um, if in doubt, and this is something that Denise said and I, I strongly support, ask us. Let us know that it's a question. If there's something unclear in the criteria, give us that and we will respond in writing on the website, not only for you but for everyone else. And so that's really important. Uh, we had more than 100 questions in the, uh, in the small and medium-sized organizations call and every one of those was answered on the site. So uh, clearly there were a lot of questions. Um, there may be in the next one as well. Keep asking them and we'll keep clarifying what, to, what it is. And if we're not clear in the response, ask us again. Um, one really important point here. If you look at the call, both in terms of what we're looking at in the criteria, and you don't quite see yourself in it, but you've got this fantastic idea that you'd like to uh, put in anyway, um, don't do it. <laughs> That's an unsolicited proposal. Go that route anyway. If you've already got an idea and it's something on, on a different topic, then give it to us as an unsolicited proposal rather than applying through the call because you're gonna get screened out. If you wrote it for something else, we're gonna see that it was written for something else and we're not gonna consider it as part of the call. So. Um, don't be disappointed. Put it in as an unsolicited proposal. That's the way to go with that. So lessons on merit assessment. We had a large number of organizations, 70% that, that made it to the merit assessment. The majority of the ones that got screened out at this point in time were for two reasons. One, managing for results. The other, risk. Uh, those were the two areas of weakness that we saw across the, uh, the largest number of, uh, of proposals. So managing for results. This is absolutely essential um, because if we don't see strength in terms of managing for results in the proposal, we're going to assume that we're not going to have strength in terms of the implementation of the project in terms of management for results. Um, and I can tell you from some of the operational projects we've got right now, there are weaknesses in this area with respect to Canadian uh, capacity. Uh, managing for results is not our strongest point. So um, we're going to be quite rigorous in terms of assessing this. We're also going to be looking at capacity building for Canadian organizations in this context. We've got uh, web documents out there as well, which provide guidance in this area. This is, this is absolutely essential, because if we're going to achieve the sustainable development results or goals, it's going to be through really, really strong management for results. So key points here, start with the result, not with the activity. 
look at what it is we're trying to achieve, and then look at what sort of things we can do to achieve those results. Don't do it in the other, other direction, because if you start with the activity and then say, well, what could we achieve with this activity, you're probably not going to be relevant to the context in which you're working. Start with the result. It's really important. So we heard yesterday about simple problems, uh, complicated problems, complex problems. I can guarantee you everything we're dealing with in international assistance is a complex problem. These are incredibly complex issues we're dealing with in foreign countries with many actors in play, uh, both uh, domestic actors as well as foreign donors. Uh, these are very complex problems. We need to really work hard to understand the context, uh, to understand who is involved in trying to find solutions, who may be resistant to some of those solutions, and what sort of uh, approaches can be used. And that's where the theory of change comes in, in terms of what is it that uh, we can do to actually make that, uh, that result uh, come about. Logical links between the levels of results are really important, and sustainability is absolutely key. Uh, sustainability in terms of when this project is over, what's going to remain in place in the long term? Absolutely essential, because what we want to avoid is a scenario in which the project ends and then, you know, shortly thereafter, there's no sense of the project ever having been there. Um, that's not a success. And sustainability does not come from phase two. Sustainability comes from achieving something that's lasting under the existing initiative. Uh, responding to risks. Complex problems, inherently risky environment. Every project that we're implementing overseas entails risks. Uh, we cannot assume away those risks. Uh, what we can do is we can plan for them, demonstrate that we have planned for them, and, and demonstrate that we have mitigation plans so that when those risks happen, and it will be when, it won't be if, we know what to do and we've got a sense of how we're going to respond. And so if you can demonstrate that to us, that's what we're looking for. Um, if you assume away the risk or you know, are, are hesitant to state the risk because you think it might undermine your ability to get funding, it's exactly the opposite. If you don't state the risk, it gives us a sense that you're not prepared to encounter the risks that are out there. So be robust. Again, Denise said, uh, I think it was four pages of risks. Perfect. Um, give us a good, really good story on the risk in terms of your awareness of it and how you're going to respond to it. Because that's, again, one of the key areas where we saw weaknesses in the, uh, in the proposals. Uh, it's got to be eyes wide open. Gender equality and human rights. This was better. Um, this was an area where some organizations fell short, but a large number had clearly been looking carefully at this, looking at the messaging we were putting out in the feminist international assistance policy, and were really treating this seriously. So some really good stuff here. Uh, having said that, where there were weaknesses, uh, it had to do with uh, perhaps uh, a lack of a connection with uh, uh, local partners in terms of uh, what the uh, partner views were on this, the local context, how amenable this was to uh, gender equality. Um, uh, so that preliminary GE analysis may not have been present. Um, how are men and boys going to be involved? Because although we're looking at women and girls as the key vehicle to, um, to achieve poverty reduction, um, looking at gender equality and how to uh, level the playing field also involves engagement with, with men and boys. Uh, there are behaviors that need to change there in order for, for women and, and girls to, uh, to have the types of benefits we're trying to seek. So speaking to that engagement is also really, really important. And then again, a broader human rights analysis. Um, there is more in play than gender equality. There are other types of rights that, uh, that we're looking to, uh, to uh, affect in a positive way here. And uh, yesterday we heard about uh, some of those with respect to uh, the disabled, with respect to the uh, LGBTQI uh, uh, um, uh, population. How are we going to uh, affect matters with respect to uh, those larger human rights issues that are, uh, are in play in, in the countries? Final area in terms of the, the merit assessment we can talk to, again, relatively strong in terms of this, but uh, environment is still a, a really important issue. There's some legislated uh, mandate issues involved here in terms of the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. We need to make sure we're not doing any harm through what we're funding, whether it's in Canada or overseas. Um, there were organizations that proposed and said there wouldn't be no uh, environmental element to the project. And then in another part of the proposal, they spoke to some of the environmental uh, elements to the project. 
So consistency in terms of this, uh, if there isn't an environmental element, that's fine, but make sure that is indeed the case and that it's not simply that you've stated that, but then uh, indicated maybe that you're going to do some renovations of schools in another part of the uh, proposal. We need to have an assessment of that in terms of how you're going to treat the environmental impact. Um, next steps. We're right now in the process of gathering lessons from the first call on uh, small and medium-sized organizations. We're working with provincial councils and, uh, and the Canadian uh, Council for International Cooperation on this. Uh, a survey has just been put out with respect to that. Uh, we're going to send that survey out ourselves as well uh, to make sure that uh, all organizations that have applied under the recent uh, SMO call uh, get a copy of that survey. And we want to get your input. Um, that input will be generic and you will not be specifically identified with respect to that. We don't, it doesn't matter who we get the input from, we need to, to get your sense of how that process has gone, where you see the weaknesses in that process and how the process can be better run in the future. So it's going to be really important for us. Um, we also want to disseminate lessons. Uh, this is part of that process today, but uh, we'll be having uh, uh, webinars, we'll be putting information out on, the, uh, on the, our website, and we'll be doing uh, meetings with proposing organizations that have specific questions. So uh, we're looking at the month of November as fairly intense in terms of this, in terms of getting as much information out there so that uh, the next time we run a, a small and medium-sized organizations call, uh, it will be more effective, uh, things will be clearer, and you'll have a better sense of what it is that uh, you need to be successful. Um, having said that, the supply-demand issue won't go away. Um, greater capacity means that uh, the proposals we get are going to be better, but at the end of the day, if we still get upwards of 200 proposals, um, there's still going to be a large number of proposals that are not successful. So just keep that in mind. Um, supply and demand is going to be a constant feature of this space uh, from what we can see going forward. Um, we will be doing capacity building activities uh, going forward, working again with the provincial councils on that. Uh, there will be a number of other calls coming up. We've already um, indicated on our website a new call that uh, will be launched shortly on education for girls. Uh, there will be another call coming up uh, with respect to the volunteer cooperation program. Uh, and uh, in the new year, there will be another uh, call with respect to small and medium-sized organizations. So lots and lots and lots of stuff coming up with respect to this. Uh, prioritize which ones you want to look at because uh, um, I would suggest maybe it's not a good plan to, to apply for them all. Um, final thoughts? We've got a detailed website which can help you a lot. We've got documents out there such as not only the policy but uh, detailed guidance on results-based management tip sheets as well as a detailed guide. I think that guide that was my previous team that wrote it is 90 plus pages. Everything you need to know about results-based management is in there. If you haven't read it, please do before you apply because there's some really, really good advice in there with respect to not only how to put together a proposal with respect to this, but how to implement a project with respect to this. Really, really helpful. Uh, how we assess your proposal. Can you just ask the question, want to know what's inside that black box? That document will tell you. So uh, click on that and uh, find out more. And then, uh, again, there's some information out there with respect to the various things we're planning to do under small and medium-sized organizations. Alors, uh, ce sont les, les renseignements d'aujourd'hui. Uh, uh, on peut uh, discuter uh, davantage uh, plus tard, uh, pas seulement pendant cette discussion, mais uh, uh, cet, cet après-midi. So um, really looking forward to having a chat about this. Um, here as well as later in the day, but also in the coming days. Um, both myself and uh, Deputy Director Shannon Fougere is here. So uh, we're available to chat with you about any specific questions you've got with respect to either recent calls or, or upcoming calls. Lots of, lots of things happening and uh, looking forward to having those discussions. Merci beaucoup.